Thanks, guys. Tim, alcoholic. Amen. All right, so we have ourselves a new cycle here. We're going to be starting off with the preface, page 11, Roman numeral XI. <clears throat> we have a long read tonight, so I'm going to hustle a little bit tonight. This is the fourth edition of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. So just as a side note, this is printed in 2001. The first edition appeared in April 1939, and in the following 16 years, more than 300,000 copies went into circulation. The second edition, published in 1955, reached a total of more than 1,150,500 copies. The third edition, which came off the press in 1976, achieved a circulation of approximately 19,550,000 in all formats. A current number uh, that we have right now is that we've printed approximately 35 million uh, copies, and we print approximately 1 million copies a year. I did the math, and that's 20,000 copies a week. So we're really, uh, really popping out the books. Uh, I was down in uh, Atlanta for the International, which obviously are every five years, and uh, the 35th millionth copy uh, was given to the uh, Sister Ignatia's religious order. Two nuns came up and accepted that as a, as a token of appreciation. Kind of interesting. <clears throat> because this book has become the basic text, which means it's a study book, right? Because this book has become the basic text for our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recovery... I underline this now, there exists strong sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. It's talking about the whole book, not just the first 164 pages. There is a resistance of cha any radical changes. Therefore, the first portion of this book, the first 164 pages, of this volume describing the AA recovery program has been left largely untouched in the course of revisions made for the second, third, and fourth editions. Some of you may not see the word largely in that sentence, and that just means that your book, your, your fourth edition book, was printed prior to 2006. After 2006, they stuck that word in to be more accurate because there are some changes in the first 164 pages. The section called The Doctor's Opinion has been kept intact just as it was originally written in 1939 by the late Dr. William D. Silkworth, our society's great medical benefactor. Dr. Silkworth died in 1950, that's what they're referring to there. Dr. Silkworth was the attending physician at uh, Towns Hospital, Central Park West, 292, 293 Central Park West, which was an upscale, upmarket detox. And he is the doctor that attended to uh, Bill Wilson originally and many of our uh, New York uh, pioneers, right? So um, the second edition added the appendices, and you can see the appendices on the page. Uh, right before this, uh, page 10, Roman numeral X, those are the appendices at the bottom there. There are seven of them. The 12 traditions and the directions for getting in touch with AA. The 12 traditions are all listed on page 561. And the 12 traditions were voted in as we have them listed here in 1950 at our uh, first uh, international in Cleveland. This was voted in. This, this was accepted by the delegates, right? But the chief change was in the section of personal stories, which was expanded to, re to reflect the fellowship's growth. So you're seeing what it's saying here. We changed the stories to match what our current uh, newcomers like, right? We want to be flexible. We want to reach them. What's the purpose of the stories? identification. Bill's story, Dr. Bob's nightmare, and one other personal history from the first edition were retained intact. Three were edited and one was retitled. New versions of two stories were written with new titles. Thirty completely new stories were added 
and the story section was divided into three parts under the same headings that are now used. In the third edition, part one, Pioneers of AA, was left unchanged. Nine of the stories in part two, they stopped in time, were carried over from the second edition. Eight new stories were added. In part three, they lost nearly all. Eight stories were retained and five new ones were added. So any story that was removed, where is it? Experience, Strength, and Hope. You can buy the book, right? AA produces that book. Every story removed is put into, uh, into that publication. <clears throat> the fourth edition includes the 12 concepts of world service. So we have steps, we have traditions, and we have 12 concepts. The 12 concepts relate to service above the group level. They were written in 1962 by Bill, and you can find them in the back of the book at 574. Page 574, you can read the concepts. Again, written in 1962. Uh, I don't know if I finished that sentence. The fourth edition includes the 12 concepts of world, services, of world service and revises the three sections of personal stories as follows. One new story has been added to part one and two that originally appeared in part three have been repositioned there. Six stories have been deleted. Six of the stories in part two have been carried over 11 new ones have been added and 11 taken out. Part 3 now includes 12 new stories. Eight were removed in addition to the two that were transferred to part 1. This is an excellent test for a newcomer. I use this as a sponsor all the time. If they can read that and understand that, they're not alcoholic. <laughs> all changes made over the years in the big book, AA members fond nickname for this volume, have had the same purpose, to represent the current membership of Alcoholics Anonymous more accurately, thereby to reach more alcoholics. So very important statement, I, I highlighted that. Any change to the book has been to reach more alcoholics. And uh, everybody know where we get the nickname Big Book? Well, it was originally a much bigger book, right? And we ha hired an editor, non-AA editor, and trimmed the book down to its current size, approximately its current size. Almost all the trimming came from the stories. You'll also notice that almost all the stories are the same length. They're about eight pages. Um, <clears throat> and the other reason was we used very thick paper. It was a little bit cheaper. And another reason why we used the thicker paper, sometimes you'll see in, in scripture-type books, very fine paper, and they're very easily ripped. So they knew that alcoholics were like completely out of control. So they went with the heavier paper so they would withstand, you know, you think you got more bang for your buck, you know. If you have a drinking problem, we hope that you may pause in reading one of the 42 personal stories and think, yes, that happened to me, or more important, yes, I felt like that, or most important, yes, I believe this program can work for me too. So it does say that there's 42 personal stories, but that means they're not counting Bill's story, which is 43, right? But in the back of the book, there's 42. Page one, Bill's story, we can count that too. Forward to the first edition. This is the forward as it appeared in the first printing of the first edition, 1939. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered Recovered from what? From a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. It only appears as though it's hopeless when you know that there's a solution. If you don't know there's a solution, it's a hopeless state of mind and body. It only appears as though, and that's going to come up later on, it only appears as though it's hopeless because we're going to talk about how to get out of the problem, right? And... Um, this is the first place we see that it's multiple authors. Every uh, 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 revision, and as this was being written primarily by Bill Wilson, but every single revision that was done to a manuscript, both Akron as a group and Brooklyn, New York as a group, voted on how to change things and you know rephrase things, put, put that out, pull that out, add that back in, that kind of thing. So it's multiple authors. 
to show other alcoholics, and it's italicized, precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. In other words, you don't need any other book. It's all in here. That's what the hope is. Turns out I think they're correct. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. So, noting that alcohol only appears in the first step, it's actually a design for living that anybody could benefit from, and that's the point it's making there um, in, uh, in the Bill Wilson, uh, the Bill W. documentary. At the end, it lists that there are over 60 anonymous fellowships that use our steps. And, and the only word that would potentially be changed is in the first step. Right? al would say what? We're powerless over the alcoholic. <laughs> it is important that we remain anonymous, meaning eternally. We remain anonymous because we are too few at present to handle the overwhelming number of personal appeals which may result from this publication. Being mostly business or professional folk, we could not well carry on our occupations in such an event. We would like it understood that our alcoholic work is an avocation. An avocation is a hobby. A vocation is your career. Right? And what is, what is it being an avocation? What does it protect us from? Big shotism. Right? I got all the answers. Right? This, this is my thing. Right? That's what it protects us from. It, which, is, which is an element of humility, which is one of the purposes of the book, Smash Ego, right? When reading, excuse me, when writing or speaking publicly about alcoholism, we urge each of our fellowship to admit his personal name, designating himself instead as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Very earnestly, we ask the press also to observe this request, for otherwise we shall be greatly handicapped. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no, see, see where you recognize this from now, right? There are no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. And, and obviously in 1950 when we put in uh, the official traditions, the word honest was dropped because of the definition. How do you, who decides who's being honest or not, right? That could cause a lot of debate and it could be used as a little bit of a weapon, I think. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. We shall be interested to hear from those who are getting results from this book, particularly from those who have commenced work with other alcoholics. It's important to be so. This is what that sentence just said. It's important to be sober, but it's more important to now pass that on. Right? We should like to be helpful to such cases. Inquiry by scientific, medical, and religious societies will be welcomed. Alcoholics Anonymous, so what do we see by it being signed that way? It's an anonymous book. No one's taking credit for authorship. Forward to second edition. Figures given in this forward describe the fellowship as it was in 1955. Since the original forward of this book was written in 1939, a wholesale miracle has taken place. Our earliest printing voiced the hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at his destination. Already, continues the early text, Twos and threes and fives of us have sprung up in other communities. Sixteen years have elapsed between our first printing of this book and the presentation in 1955 of our second edition. In that brief space, Alcoholics Anonymous has mushroomed into nearly 6,000 groups whose membership is far above 150,000 recovered alcoholics. Groups are to be found in each of the United States and all the provinces of Canada. 
AA has flourishing communities in the British Isles, the Scandinavian countries, South Africa, South America, Mexico, Alaska, Australia, and Hawaii. All told, personal be pro excuse me, promising beginnings have been made in some 50 foreign countries and U.S. possessions. Some are just now taking shape in Asia. Many of our friends encourage us by saying that this is but a beginning, only the augury of a much larger future ahead. And an augury, of course, I looked up, is a sign, a sign of, much, of a much larger future ahead. The spark that was to flare into the first AA group was struck at Akron, Ohio in June 1935 during a talk between a New York stockbroker and an Akron physician, and of course we're talking about Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith. Six months earlier, the broker, Bill Wilson, had been relieved of his drinking obsession by a sudden spiritual experience following a meeting with an alcoholic friend. So the alcoholic friend is Abby Thatcher who had been in contact with the Oxford groups of that day. And the Oxford groups were a Protestant, non-denominational um, gathering, fellowship, missionary-type fellowship, who would um, have, try to elicit some sort of spiritual uh, experience or awakening, and then their sole job was to pass that on. That was the goal behind it. Frank Buckman, the founder of it, the international founder of it, was Lutheran, and the U.S. Uh, 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 primary um, leader was Reverend Sam Shoemaker at Calvary Church in Manhattan on Central Park South. And uh, he was Episcopalian. And uh, they, uh, it was a first century Christian fellowship was its original name, ultimately called the Oxford Groups, because one of the things that was a belief of the, of the group was you change society from the top down. You change from, from high society to lower society. You didn't start at the bottom. And uh, what uh, Frank Buckman would do is he'd go to various um, uh, 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 upscale schools, Ivy League schools, uh, Oxford University, and they were traveling at one time as a group and the, um, the uh, porter wrote on everybody's bag, there were little tags on everybody's bag, Oxford Group. And they picked up that handle then and ran with it. The media used Oxford Group as their name, and that became their, their actual name. He had also been greatly helped by the late Dr. William D. Silkworth, a New York specialist in alcoholism who is now accounted no less than a medical saint by AA members, and whose story of the early days of our society appears in the next pages. From this doctor, the broker had learned the grave nature of alcoholism, meaning it's progressive and fatal, though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups. So the tenets are their beliefs, it, 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 uh, they, they are um, they are the, uh, they didn't have steps. They had tenets of which they would try and follow. And somebody went through the time of going through Ann Smith's diary and found that there were at least 28 tenets. So see what it said there? It said, though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups, meaning Bill Wilson, he was convinced of the need for, and now here's five of the tenets. Right, the five C's we talk about, the octave five C's. Watch this. Moral inventory, confession of personality defects, restitution to those harmed, helpfulness to others, and the necessity of belief in and dependence upon God. So the five C's that you commonly hear in, in, uh, uh, when discussing historical uh, Oxford Group stuff is confidence, confession, conviction, conversion, continuance. I'll tell you later on if you want to write that down. And I just wanted to highlight in that last sentence, the second part of the half sen uh, second half of that last sentence, and the necessity of belief in, that's faith, and dependence upon, that's trust. 
Two different things. One's much deeper than the other. One you prove. Prior to his journey to Akron, the broker had worked hard with many alcoholics on the theory that only an alcoholic could help an alcoholic. I underline that because it's not completely true. We're going to see what it says right after this, right? So let's see what it just said. It said, the broker had worked hard with many alcoholics on the theory that only an alcoholic could help another alcoholic. But he had succeeded only in keeping sober himself, means he failed. Let's see what he learns then. The broker had gone to Akron on a business venture which had collapsed, leaving him greatly in fear that he might start drinking again. He suddenly realized that in order to save himself, he must carry his message to another alcoholic. See the difference? If you don't, look at it at home. It's, it's so important. The al that alcoholic to turned, out, turned out to be the Akron physician. This physician had repeatedly tried spiritual means to resolve his alcoholic dilemma, but had failed. But when the broker gave him Dr. Silkworth's description of alcoholism and its hopelessness, the physician began to pursue the spiritual remedy, remedy for his malady with a willingness he had never before been able to muster. He sobered never to drink again up to the moment of his death in 1950. This seemed to prove that one alcoholic could affect another as no alcoholic could. It also indicated that strenuous work, not casual, not when it comes up, not when somebody asks you, strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, was vital to permanent recovery. So we get sober on the steps, we stay sober on 12, bringing it to someone else. Our whole purpose is to do good 12-step work. Hence, the two men set to work almost frantically upon alcoholics arriving in the ward of the Akron City Hospital. Their very first case, a desperate one, recovered immediately and became AA number three. They're talking about Bill Dotson. Um, he had been, I believe, uh, in the uh, detox eight times in the last six months. He considered himself hopeless. And uh, to have, a, to have a, uh, a transcendence, a psychic change, a complete rewiring, uh, that quickly uh, even surprised Bill and Dr. Bob, right? Um, but, you know, if I had to change one word, if I had to change one word, I would change one word in this sentence. And it would be their very first successful case. Because the two, the two of them had tried on two other people prior to that. Dr. Roy McKay failed on, with him, and uh, Eddie Riley, and originally, uh, initially failed with him also, but he got sober later on, so we'll call him a success. So Dr. Roy McKay and Eddie Riley were before Bill Dotson. He never had another drink. This work at Akron continued through the summer of 1935. There were many failures, but there was an occasional heartening success. When the broker returned to New York in the fall of 1935, the first AA group had actually been formed, That though no one realized it at the time. One other little historical thing I would have loved for it to have been in there is uh, Ernie Galbraith was, uh, was uh, AA number four. So when Bill goes back to New York, he's staying in Akron, right? He goes back to New York in the fall. There was actually four of them. Um, a second small group prop promptly took shape in New York to be followed in 1937 with the start of a third at Cleveland. And uh, who started uh, our third group in Cleveland? Clarence Snyder. Clarence Snyder, the home brewmeister. You can read his story in Experience, Strength, and, and Hope. I like that, he, that he made his own booze. Besides these, there were scattered alcoholics who had picked up 
the basic ideas in Akron or New York who were trying to form groups in other cities. By late 1937, the number of members having substantial sobriety time behind them was sufficient to convince the membership that a new light had in, entered the dark world of the alcoholic. And anybody know what that number was? 40. Correct. Thank you, Gail. It was now time, the struggling groups thought, to place their message. See that? It's plural. It's not Bill's message. It means it's the message that they've all agreed upon. Everybody's on board, right? To place their message and unique experience before the world. This determination bore, bore fruit in the spring of 1939 by the publication of this volume. The membership had then reached about 100 men and women. So it was actually about, and we can debate the numbers, but just going with this stat right here, 99 men and one woman. One woman. And that's why our book was not originally called 100 Men. That was, that was the original title that we were going to call it, and we had one gal with a, about a year's sobriety, Florence Rankin, and she said, like, oh, time out. Can't do that, right? And there's a little back story there, which we'll leave alone right now, but um, uh, that's how we ended up choosing Alcoholics Anonymous. But you'll note that the, the, the text didn't change then. They couldn't change the text at that time. In the book, it makes the assumption that the alcoholic is male, right? The fledgling society, which had been nameless, now began to be called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of its own book. The flying blind period ended and AA entered a new phase of its pioneering time. With the appearance of the new book, a great deal began to happen. Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick, the noted clergyman, reviewed it with approval. In the fall of 1939, Fulton Erzler, then editor of Liberty, printed a piece in his magazine called Alcoholics and God. This brought a rush of 800 frantic inquiries into the little New York office, which, meanwhile, had been established. Each inquiry was painstakingly answered. Pamphlets and books were sent out. Businessmen traveling out of existing groups were referred to these prospective newcomers. New groups started up, and it was found to the astonishment of everyone, that AA's message could be transmitted in the mail as well as by word of mouth. And what's a little interesting about that was they were very, very surprised. They didn't know if it was going to work or not. But they, before the book was printed, they sent out a bunch of uh, manuscripts for approval to, to various doctors and, and religious folk. And uh, somehow one ends up in the hand of an alcoholic's mother on the West Coast, San Francisco, I believe. And uh, she ultimately reads it and then gives it to her son. And her son is struck sober by reading the manuscript, reading the text. And go, goes, he actually works in a psychiatric hospital as like a, uh, an attendant in some way. And he starts helping. He starts seeing these ment mentally ill people. A lot of them are alcoholics. And he starts, he's, he's on fire. He's on absolute fire. And the mother writes New York and says, you're not going to believe this. My son got sober. The son ultimately writes Ruth Hawk. They're writing back. And they say, first guy to get sober off the text, send his ass out here. We want to meet him. And they pop him. Uh, they, uh, well, actually, he wrote his story. I, I believe his mother helped or Ruth Hawk helped with writing his story. His story is called Lone Endeavor. Experience, Strength, and Hope. Lone Endeavor. And it's Pat Cooper. Pat Cooper. He takes the bus from the West Coast, shows up at New York. Bill's there. Fitz Mayo's there. Hank Parkhurst is there waiting for him to come off the bus. All the people come off, no one comes off. And they go to the driver. They go, what's going on? Is there anybody else in the bus? Oh, yeah, there's a drunk in the back. He's... So his story got pulled out. It, it made the first, but, okay, right. <clears throat> by the end, uh, by the end of 19, I think the story ended well, though. I think later on he got sober. By the end of 1939, it was estimated that 800 alcoholics were on their way to recovery. In the spring of 1940, John D. Rockefeller Jr. gave a dinner for many of his friends, to which he invited AA members to tell their stories. So uh, 75 people accepted uh, uh, the invitation. He sent out invitations to 187. Only 75 
right? Because he told them it was about alcoholics, right? Nobody's going, right? He sends it out to 187 people, 75 except nine of them are AA guys. So that's a low turnout. Like, I'd be very upset at my guest list, right? News of this got out on the world wires. Inquiries poured in again, and many people went to the bookstores to get the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. By March 1941, the membership had shot up to 2,000. Then Jack Alexander wrote a feature article in Saturday Evening Post and placed such a compelling picture of AA before the general public that alcoholics in need of help really deluged us. By the close of 1941, AA numbered 8,000 members. The mushrooming process was in full swing. AA had become a national institution. Our society then entered a fearsome and exciting adolescent period. The test that it faced was this. Could these large numbers of erstwhile erratic alcoholics successfully meet and work together? So erstwhile, formally, erratic, unpredictable, no fixed or regular course, formally unpredictable alcoholics. Would there be strivings for power and prestige? Would there be schisms that would split AA apart? Soon AA was beset by these very problems on every side and in every group. But out of this frightening and at first disrupting experience, the conviction grew that AAs had to hang together or die separately. So now for the next sentence and the whole rest of the next paragraph, it's all the traditions. Watch them. We had to unify our fellowship or pass off the scene as we discovered the principles by which the individual alcoholic could live, meaning the steps, right? So we had to evolve principles by which the AA groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively. It was thought that no alcoholic man or woman could be excluded from our society, that our leaders might serve but never govern, that each group was to be autonomous and there was to be no professional class of therapy. There were to be no fees or dues. Our expenses were to be met by our own voluntary contributions. There, were, there was to be the least possible organization, even in our service centers. Our pu public relations were to be based upon attraction rather than promotion. It was decided that all members ought to be anonymous at the level of press, radio, TV, and films. And in no circumstances should we give endorsements, make alliances, or enter public controversies. This was the substance of AA's 12 traditions which are stated in full on page 561 of this book. Though none of these principles had the force of rules or laws, they had become so widely accepted by 1950 that they were confirmed by our first international conference held at Cleveland. Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. So we saw that, uh, again, uh, Cleveland was our, uh, was our first international, and we do one every five years. We just did one in Atlanta. Where's our next one? So uh, on the five, so 2015, 2020, where's the next one? Detroit. Was the one after that? Vancouver. <clears throat> just in case you're putting it in your calendar. <laughs> while, while, the, while the internal difficulties of our adolescent period were being ironed out, Public acceptance of AA grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons. I underline this. Let's see what the first reason is. The large number of recoveries, so successes. People got sober. That's, the, that's one reason. And reunited homes. In other words, how it affected the rest of the world. Just getting sober on our own, but leaving the world, you know, in disarray, our family, you know, the whole bit. You know, sometimes you can't save those things initially, but you can have, you know, positive interactions later on after a period of time, right? That's what made, this is the principal reason why this thing grew. Personal recovery 
and fixing um, uh, other, uh, helping to improve other people's lives. These made their impressions everywhere of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried. 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses, and among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other, thou other thousands came to a few AA meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program. But great numbers of these, about two out of three, began to return as time passed. Another reason, so here's third reason, another reason for the wide acceptance of AA was the administration of friends, administration, the help of friends. Friends in medicine, religion, and the press, together with innumerable others who became our able and persistent advocates. Without such support, AA could have made only the slowest progress. Some of the recommendations of AA's early medical and religious friends will be found further on in this book. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religious organization. Neither does AA take any particular medical point of view, though we cooperate widely with the men of medicine as well as with the men of religion. Alcohol being no respecter of persons, we are an accurate cross-section of America and in distant lands the same democratic evening up process is now going on. By personal religious affiliation, we include Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Hindus, and a sprinkling of Muslims and Buddhists. More than 15% of us are women. What's our current stat? 38%. Uh, that was as of uh, 2014. <clears throat> 38%. At present, our membership is pyramiding at a rate of about 20% a year. So far, upon the total problem of several million actual and potential alcoholics in the world, we have, own, we have made only a scratch. In all probability, we shall never be able to touch more than a fair fraction of the alcohol problem and all its ramifications. Upon therapy for the alcoholic himself, we surely have no monopoly. Yet, it is our great hope that all those who have yet found no answer may begin to find one in the pages of this book and will presently join us on the high road to a new freedom. Forward to the third edition. You'll note that uh, uh, Bill dies in 1971. First thing you should note is the different tone in the forward to the third edition, which is written in 76 and length. By March 1976, when this edition went to the printer, the total worldwide membership of Alcoholics Anonymous was conservatively estimated at more than one million, with almost 28,000 groups meeting in over 90 countries. Surveys of groups in the United States and Canada indicate that AA is reaching out not only to more and more people, but to a wider and wider range. Women now make up more than one-fourth of the membership. Among newer members, the proportion is nearly one-third. Seven percent of the AA surveyed are less than 30 years of age, among them many in their teens. The basic principles, meaning the steps, they're talking about the steps, the basic principles of the AA program, it appears, hold good for individuals with many different lifestyles, just as the program has brought recovery to those of many different nationalities. The 12 steps that summarize the program may be called Los Doches Pesos in one country and Le Dos Etapas in another but they trace exactly the same path to recovery, meaning the steps are the same, that was, bla that was blazed by the earliest members of Alcoholics Anonymous. In spite of the great increase in the size and span of this fellowship, at its core it remains simple and personal. Each day, somewhere in the world, recovery begins when one alcoholic talks with another alcoholic, sharing experience, strength, and hope. What it was like, what happened, what it's like now, right? Forward to the fourth edition. This 
fourth edition of Alcoholics Anonymous came off the press in November 2001, at the start of a new millennium. Since the third edition was published in 1976, worldwide membership of AA has just about doubled to an estimated 2 million or more, with nearly 100,800 groups meeting in approximately 150 countries around the world. So a 2015 number is... 2.4 million members, 2.4 million. Literature has played a major role in AA's growth and a striking phenomenon of the past quarter century has been the explosion of translations of our basic literature into many languages and dialects. In country after country where the AA seed was planted, it has taken root slowly at first then growing by leaps and bounds when literature has become available. So that's really uh, uh, pinpointing uh, the, the author's belief that literature was instrumental in our, in our spread. Currently, Alcoholics Anonymous has been translated into 43 languages. As the message of recovery has reached larger numbers of people, it has also touched the lives of a vastly greater variety of suffering alcoholics. When the phrase, we are people who normally would not mix, page 17 of this book, was written in 1939, it referred to a fellowship composed largely of men and a few women with quite similar social, ethnic, and economic backgrounds. And what they're really talking about is everybody came off of the Oxford group initially, not everybody, but that's how we originated. And they were primarily white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and almost all were middle class or upper, upper middle class, doctor, lawyer, stockbroker, business person. Like so much of AA's basic text, those words have proved to be far more visionary than the founding members could ever have imagined. The stories added to this section represent, excuse me, to this edition represent a membership whose characteristics of age, gender, race, and culture have widened and have deepened to encompass virtually everyone the first hundred members could have hoped to reach. While our literature has preserved the integrity of the AA message, sweeping changes in society as a whole are reflected in new customs and practices within the fellowship. That speaks to flexibility to me. Taking advantage of technological advances, for example, AA members with computers can participate in meetings online, sharing with fellow alcoholics across the country or around the world. In any meeting, anywhere, AA share, experience, strength, and hope with each other in order to stay sober, one, and help other alcoholics, too. And that's the order. Modem to modem or face to face, AA speak the language of the heart in all its power and simplicity.